Welcome back. I hope you're all focusing. <laughs> Take a deep breath. It's my delight to introduce uh, our speaker, John McDark. He's been a member of the theology department here at Boston College since completing his doctoral work in the psychology of religious development at Harvard in 1979. He taught courses in integrating spirituality and psychology for students in religious education, pastoral ministry, counseling psychology, and social work. In addition to his teaching responsibilities at BC, John is currently the first director of the New Center for Psychotherapy and Spirituality at the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology. John is certified teacher of focusing, so you better pay attention. <laughs> he trained under Dr. Joan Klagsbrun and the late Neil Hartmann. He was the keynote speaker and workshop leader for the third annual All-Ireland Conference on focusing three years ago. And the theme was focusing and spirituality. On a personal note, I also, that's a very dry description of you, John. I didn't write it. Uh, I'm reading it. I wrote it. <laughs> you wrote it. But uh, John is also a delightful character. And also, but more importantly than that, um, John has been very much involved for years in prison ministry and teaches a lot of courses at Norfolk uh, Institution. And uh, I've had the pleasure of going there on his behalf a few times to celebrate the liturgy with the prisoners, and they all speak highly of him. So that is a great, a great uh, accomplishment. So without further ado, John McDark. Thank you, John. I have to wait till this gets on, oh, it's on green. Um, some of you know, if you've ever studied in Asia, that you never begin a teaching without honoring your teachers, because all teaching is basically transmission, right? What we've been given as gift, we pass as gift. And I decided 32 years ago, when I crossed the river from Harvard to here, that I would always honor my teacher. And my teacher was an extraordinary uh, Quaker scholar named Bill Rogers. He had studied at the University of Chicago under Carl Rogers, no relation. And uh, he taught courses in pastoral care and counseling and pastoral psychology at Harvard Divinity School. And one time we asked Bill, what do you do to prepare for a day of listening to those beloved strangers who find their way into your office? And he gave two answers. The first was no surprise, he being a Quaker, he said, I sit in silence. I listen for that of God within. The second answer took me years to figure out as the brilliant response it was, he said, and then I listen to poetry. I read poetry. Because if you think about it, if someone is going to talk to you about their life, they never give you a case study. No one ever walked into you and gave you their DSM-4 rating, right? I'm a 36-year-old heterosexual white male, I'm an <laughs> access one. They give you metaphor, right? They say, sister, I feel like someone just kicked me off a cliff into 32 feet of water with alligators. Uh, and so I decided that um, I would always begin by honoring that. So we want to turn this down a little bit? Ah, OK. Thank you. I don't know how much I Thank you. OK. So how are, uh, maybe up a little bit more? OK. Bob, thank you. Great, great. Who says uh, a little bit of MIT hit Harvard there? Thank you. <laughs> How many Harvard men to turn down the microphone? <laughs> Four, actually. One to do the work, one to write a critical analysis, and three to do the press releases. <laughs> OK. So uh, honoring, honoring Bill. Um, I just wanted us to take a moment to draw a breath, give us a little space of silence. And into that silence, I want to share a poem by Rilke, which I think is a great way of launching us today. So take a moment just to notice we're here.
You see, I want a lot. Perhaps I want everything. The darkness that comes with every infinite fall and the shivering blaze of every step up. So many live on and want nothing and are raised to the rank of prince by the slippery ease of their light judgments. But what you love to see are faces that do work and feel thirst. You love most of all those who need you as they need a crowbar or a hoe. You love most of all those who need you as they need a crowbar or a hoe. You have not grown old, and it is not too late to dive into your increasing depths or life calmly gives out its own secret. You have not grown old, and it is not too late. I find that very heartening at 63. <laughs> I think we're all here because we want to be used. We want to be of use, right? Um, and we are surrounded every day by people who thirst for meaning, for significance, for a knowing witness. And often what stands in our way is the feeling of, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how to give the answers that people are asking me for. And the primary supposition of this workshop is that our big job is not to supply answers, but to find a way of helping ourselves and one another to access what it is we may already know about our own truth, to find our way forward, not by having some smart art person like ourselves tell people what we should do, <laughs> but by enabling people to listen to what they already know. Uh, in many ways, this uh, uh, afternoon workshop maps right on to the, the wonderful workshop we were was just listening to with Bob. I, I loved that workshop. Uh, as the, the father of a, uh, yes, <laughs> second round of deserved applause. As a father of a just stopped being a teenager, 20 year old, the difficult conversations I have all came flooding back to me. And, um, and boy, I wish I had done this uh, 15 years ago. Uh, but it, the, uh, since part of what Bob is teaching us is how to attend to the feelings that are undergird all of our difficult conversations, one of the things we're going to be noticing is how to notice you even have feelings. I, I love uh, your example, for example, of the person calling you and saying, well, you give an announcement, and the immediate was, I don't do announcements. <laughs> Um, a little later, I have themes and variations on that immediate response. And then what it takes when you catch up to yourself and notice all that is going on underneath that. So I want to talk a little bit about what focusing is, what it isn't. And I think I want to, to begin with a person, rather than the historical introduction, which I will do in a minute, how this uh, idea of a process um, that is not copyrighted, is something that all of us do, some of us all the time, some of us rarely, uh, uh, how it really got into the bloodstream of uh, therapists, spiritual directors, uh, folks actually around the world. But I want to give you my own personal encounter with it, because it may be exemplary. Uh, in the seventh year of my time at Boston College, a year before I was to come up for tenure, uh, I was given a job offer of a teaching position at another university which will go unnamed because I'm going to say some snarky things about it. <laughs> um, but they made me a very generous offer. Uh, and I tried to make the decision the way any university educated, rational person would. I made this list of pros and cons. Have you ever tried to make a decision that way? You know? And so I was trying to be very rational because that's what we academics do. You know, we live from here up, right? Uh, like the, the uh, Harvard Law students that Bob was talking about. Um, and so I made my list. Um, more money, more prestige. Now, when they unionized over at Harvard, they had little buttons called, you can't eat prestige. But, you know, <laughs> but hey, you know, this was great. Um, this was long enough ago that computers were just coming in, and they offered me my own big computer. It was you know, back in the days when they were huge. You know? um, and so there were many more pluses. And of course, the big plus is they wanted me. <laughs> You know, uh, one of those five emotional needs, you know, affiliation, recognition. Uh, but something 
about that decision did not want to be made. There was no right, it wasn't falling off the tree into my hand. I felt very stuck in that decision. And so I called this very wise uh, Jesuit, who was then my spiritual director uh, at BC, and I said, Dan, I'm struggling with this choice. I've gone to the vice president and said, can you move tenure decision up a year? He said, no. You know, if you choose to go to this other place, um, you'll have to do it not knowing whether you got tenure here or not. So I went in to see him. I showed him my list. And he said, that is not the way you make a decision like this. He said, I think you already know all that you need to know about this place. But you don't know that you know it. This felt like a Zen koan. You know, what, is that? what do you mean? Uh, he said, why don't you try this? We're going to do a little thought experiment. Close your eyes. And I want you to imagine that you have uh, resigned from Boston College and you're walking up the front stairs of this new institution on the first day. And I want you to pay attention to whatever arises in your body. Body? I have a body? <laughs> <laughs> I'm an academic. I don't have a body. <laughs> no, just you know, get into the fantasy, visualize it, and notice whatever you notice. So I sit there, and the first thing I notice is I was having trouble breathing. I, I was actually feeling like I had to work hard to draw a breath. And then he asked me whether there was a word or a phrase or an image that accompanied that body sensation. In a few minutes, we'll talk about that as getting a handle. I was having a body felt sense around this fantasy of walking into the school. And then I paused and said, well, I did have a little fantasy, but it's really crazy. He said, don't censor yourself, but welcome whatever arises. So I said, I, I imagine that as I walked in, there's this big basket full of gas masks. And um, in order to walk into the building, you have to put on a gas mask, because there's poisonous gas in the hallways. <laughs> now, if you go into someone's classroom, the windows are open, and they're nice people, and you can take off the gas mask. But you can't get from office to office without a gas mask. And Dan said, you know, I think your body <laughs> knows something about this institution that you're not acknowledging. And I sat there for a very long time. And then I began to realize that um, even though the higher administration were doing a full court press to, to rush me for this school, around the corners of every conversation, there were junior faculty or graduate students who were saying, this is a really toxic atmosphere. A really toxic answer. And so I called the dean and I turned it down. And then I had a moment of panic. I was thinking, you know, St. Ignatius says, if you're, if you're on the beam of the will of God, you should experience consolation without cause. And I was desperate. I made the wrong decision. <laughs> you know, I called my partner at the time and he said, relax. You have till 5 o'clock to change your mind. And I just allowed myself to surrender that decision, to give it over and say, okay, I'm going to trust this. Well, about a month later, actually, I got a call from a colleague of mine at another institution. She had been offered the job I had turned down. And she said, uh, would you care to tell me why you declined it? And I said, I think what would be more useful is to ask you whether you've had any fantasies about this place. <laughs> she was a Jungian analyst. And so she, you know, she paid attention to dreams. So I said, so, so have you had any dreams about this? And she said, funny you should say that. Just the other day, I was taking a nap, and uh, I had this dream. And I was at this school, in the school cafeteria. And I was at the top of a huge slide, like they have in a water park, on a little cafeteria tray. And I was about to plunge down this big, dark hole. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I think you should pay attention to that. <laughs> no, 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 no. She said, this is a great career opportunity. I really want to get back to this city. My husband has got a job there. You know. So she took the job. And I didn't hear anything from her um, for almost a year. In fact, it was a, almost a year to the, the week. I got a phone call from her. So I want to tell you what happened at the last faculty meeting of the year. And I don't want you to say, I told you so. <laughs> so what happened? And she said, I got up and said, this is the most racist, sexist, homophobic institution I've ever taught at. And she resigned. And there was a long pause. And she said, I knew that, didn't I? I said, well, you did, but you didn't know that you knew it. 
Well, what I didn't know is that uh, uh, Father Lush, my spiritual director, had trained with two remarkable then Jesuits, Ed McMahone and um, Peter Campbell, who had studied under a remarkable figure by the name of Eugene Gendlin, who I will put a little image up here. Uh, Gendlin and uh, Carl Rogers at the University of Chicago collaborated in the 60s in a research project trying to figure out what predicted transformation in psychotherapy. Could you, could you figure out who would actually change in some helpful way and who just stayed stuck? And they analyzed the transcripts of first therapy meetings and then uh, looked at some measures uh, a year or so out into the therapy, both self-report and uh, other report, as to who actually was able to use therapy in a way that changed their life in the way that you hope you'll get if you're paying $150 an hour. <laughs> and they discovered they could predict who changed by looking at the very first transcript. They discovered that change in therapy was not related to the theoretical orientation or the wisdom of the, the therapist. It didn't seem to be related to the content of the therapy. Folks who changed, when you looked at their transcripts, you noticed something interesting. They didn't come in with clear, precise announcements about what was wrong with them. They seemed to be kind of floundering at the edge of some kind of knowing. They'd start saying, well, Doc, you know, it's like I'm, I'm pissed off all, well, it's not exactly. It's more like I'm, I don't know, I'm just I'm kind of disappointed. And, and they seem to be falling down somewhere inside themselves, groping to articulate something that they didn't quite know, but that was true about them. And Jenlin uh, came to call this ability, the ability to access a felt sense that all of us know more than we can say and that often when we deal with the clear and precise ideas about the way it is for us, we manage to lose the inner intricacy and the knowledge, the wisdom that we are actually sitting on, as I did in that incident there. If I had stayed with the, the laundry list of uh, uh, pros and cons, cost-benefit analysis, uh, I would have, a, a year from the day, of uh, entering the institution might very well have stood up at the final faculty meeting and have the same kind of announcement. Gentlemen felt that this was a skill, this was an, an ability that all of us had at least some of the time and some of us live quite naturally out of it. When I teach focusing, some people know exactly right away what I'm talking about. Doesn't everybody do that? By the way, it tends more often to be women, but it's not entirely gender specific. Um, uh, some of us who are intellectually trained, we have a real hard time noticing these things. And not just noticing, but paying attention to them, honoring them, allowing them to vote um, in our decision making or our discernment about life. Uh, Jenlin uh, capsulized this uh, insight in a wonderful little epigram. Experience is a myriad richness. We think more than we can say we feel more than we can think, we live more than we can feel, and there is still much more. So what he did is he, he looked, he was by uh, background a phenomenologist, um, a, a student of, of, of Heidegger and Husserl, and he looked at the phenomenology of, of human thought and the deep substrata of all of our thinking. Remember uh, Bob's um, slide about, about a lot of thinking and reasoning, uh, thoughts and feelings. And feelings, by the way, as we'll talk a little later, uh, are actually more foundational than emotions, you know, because it's really a whole body state that has tremendous complexity to it. Um, often when we, we come up with one feeling, it's actually not the whole of it. Um, there's always more, as Chen Lin says. And he said, I bet people can be taught can be coached around learning how to give that deep attention to their knowledges. This, by the way, some of you are hopeful already making connections to the way there is, there is a long tradition within Christian spirituality, Ignatian spirituality perhaps particularly, of attending to 
that way of that, that knowledge, noticing the flow of energies and passions and desires, and taking that seriously as data about how we're drawn, what's unfolding in our lives. So there are three big ideas in, in focusing that I, I want us to look at. This, by the way, is the book available out here, or in fine stores everywhere, Amazon.com, wherever you want it, in which he, this is now in a new edition, um, in which he sort of lays this out in ways that he hopes are accessible to everybody. You don't need to be a phenomenologist to get it. Let me say what focusing is not. It is not concentration. Focus, you know. It's not, those of us who are madly ADD, and I have a little piece of that, um, this is not about overcoming your scatteredness. There is a lightness to it, to focusing. Um, it is not uh, going for our desire in this sort of primitive way. Uh, what it is, is a body sensation that has meaning. A body sensation that has meaning. Uh, there is a, a wonderful um, line from an essay by David Rome that I think summarizes this well. Focusing is a practice of bringing gentle, interested attention to one's bodily felt experience. Think about the example I, I just gave there. I was sitting there, and Dan's invitation is, what do you notice, whatever arises? And uh, notice it, and allow it then to speak to you. Allow it to pass into language. Bodily felt here means the nonverbal texture, affect, that lo lies before or below our conceptual formulations. It can be experienced as a vague body sense that is more than just physical. Um, so uh, often our body sense, we have to sort out, is this feeling in my stomach uh, the pizza I had, or is it, is it telling, saying something more to me? And I allow myself to unpack it, uh, allow myself to, to notice uh, how it might shift as I attend to it. It is the way our body is holding our particular situation right now. The bodily sense of felt sense, as it is commonly called, is not the same thing as feeling one's emotions. The felt sense lies beneath emotions like anger, jealousy, or desire. It is more subtle and less susceptible of naming. Felt senses are free of the storyline that accompanies an emotion. I'm angry because such and such happened. That's often what the way we short circuit our knowing, right? is we think we know what it's about. Let me give you just one example. Um, I, I was privileged uh, about three or four years ago to be invited by a remarkable group of women, both uh, women religious and uh, women who are pastoral counselors, to be an, a companion facilitator for group spiritual direction. They called themselves the Sophias. W wisely, too. These were really wise. So I got to be an honorary Sophia, great honor. And at our very first meeting, there were to be five women there, and there were only four. And the fourth woman, uh, who was supposed to be there, uh, didn't show up. And I realized that we couldn't get on until we had noticed uh, how it felt to have this woman missing. And I said, so what do you notice? We've got an empty chair here. Um, what's going on here for you? And the first response was, one says, I'm angry. Uh, I'm angry that she, she didn't call. And, and I said, well, is that all that you are right now? Just notice. And uh, each of the women began doing some focusing on what they were feeling. And underneath that anger, there was a texture of fear. Did something happen to her? Um, disappointment, uh, concern. And then I said, um, in order to be able to go on and spend the rest of the morning here, maybe you need to ask, what do those feelings need? And they discerned as a group, individually in this group, that what the feelings needed was to know that when we were done our first session, they were going to get on the phone, uh, all of them, and call and find out what happened. And once they had identified that, then there was this felt shift, a kind of sense of relief. Oh, this is what we're feeling, or all of what we're feeling. And this is something we can do about it. Now, let's go down to business as the, the foursome. You can still play bridge with four. You know, we're going to do our work. 
Um, but that was a very important education, and actually an important way of beginning what's been a wonderful several year process of meeting with this group, um, because it was allowing what was happening in the room to be real. Uh, my study of focusing has very much changed the way, I, by the way, I do not only therapy, but spiritual direction. Because too often, spiritual direction is people reporting something that happened out there over the last month. And focusing has allowed something real to occur in the room and in the between in a way that has, has very much shifted the way we proceed. Um, so focusing uh, is the handout. It's a natural skill. It can be discovered, but it's not invented. And it was discovered by looking at what people are doing when they're changing successfully, repeating Jenlin and, and Rogers' big discovery. Now, if you're sitting there and thinking, I haven't a clue what he's talking about, we may need to give ourselves a little bit of an experience of noticing that we've got a felt sense going on. Um, so I ask you to remember, have you ever woken up from um, a dream and you can't recall the content of the dream, but there's a sort of effect, there's an atmosphere that the dream has left inside of you, okay? Now, most of us just jump out of bed and brush our teeth at that point. But have you noticed, or I invite you to consider, what would happen if you stayed in the atmosphere of this dream, the content of which you don't precisely remember, but notice how it's already inflecting the way you're about to move into the world. And sometimes if you stay with the atmospherics, the climate, you actually can discover elements of the dream and notice something that you're carrying. Okay. Um, you walk into a strange room, and uh, you're already making some pre-conscious decisions about where to sit, what feels safe, right? Not too, not too up to the front, you know, that's a little too vulnerable, not to the back. Uh, we're, we are all the time guided by our felt sense, and we're barely aware that we're doing it. Or you go into a restaurant, and if you're not overriding your choices uh, by what you think you should have, you know, what's you know, on your diet or what would your mother approve of, uh, you stop and say, what am I, what am I hungry for? Um, and often, by the way, we, we don't eat well because we don't pay attention. Uh, we override those choices, right? Or we get talked out of them. Um, there's a wonderful group of clinical psychologists I started meeting with at Harvard many years ago at the old Ferdinand's in Harvard Square. We'll find out who's really been around if you remember Ferdinand. And what I loved about those people is they ordered dessert at lunchtime. And I thought, this is great. Because I had, you know, in my very strict German Catholic family, you never order dessert in a restaurant. You know, we'd be looking at it long and most, we'll, hey, we'll have ice cream at home. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we override uh, often our own knowing by other kinds of voices that intrude themselves. So um, how do we get a sense of, um, uh, of this felt sense. Let's try one, I'm going to do a kind of uh, experiment here. I'd like you in a moment to close your eyes. I'd like you to visualize someone you would really love to see today. Someone who today, and again, not someone you think you should like to see, but someone that you would really delight to spend time with. Let's take a moment and I think it's helpful to close your eyes for this one. See whether you can evoke the image of someone you really would delight to see. Raise your hand when you've, you've identified somebody. Okay. Okay, hands down. Now I want you to imagine that uh, it, when you walk out of this door at the end of this break, there they are. You know, somehow, Star Wars technology or Star Trek technology, they've been beamed down, there they are. And notice what happens in your body as you go out and there they are. And you blow off the rest of the conference and go off and have coffee with them or something. What do you notice? Hey, Maybe there's a word or a phrase that 
identifies what it's like to spend time this afternoon with this person. So the visit is over. You thank them for showing up. And you open your eyes when you're ready. Sorry to cut the visit short. Okay. Now, what I'd like you to do in just a moment is um, say uh, to the person next to you, find someone to talk to, just what you notice. You don't have to identify at all who you saw, by the way. The great thing about focusing, my, my teacher, Joan Clegsburn, used to say it's gestalt therapy for introverts. Because you, you can do this work without ever actually talking about the content. You can actually be guided through a focusing process and never reveal to the other person what you're actually dealing with. Just have their help walking through the process of accessing this inner intricacy. So just share with whoever is uh, sitting next to you, around you, um, just what you noticed in your body, and if there was a word or phrase. And just take turns, it's very, very quick, you know. Talk to the person about what you noticed. And, and let the person you're, you're sharing that with, um, just say back to you what they heard. Is this mine or yours? It must be mine. Okay. So make sure both of you had a chance to share. Yes, please. OK. Thank you. OK. So do you feel you were able to articulate a felt sense? Okay, you, know, you notice the difference? Now, if we were really going to carry this on, I would have you visualize the least, per, the person you would least want to see <laughs> in this moment. And then you could contrast the feelings. But I, I think, you know, we'll stay a little upbeat on this one. Um, but, but, but notice, right? You know? And let me ask you, how was it to have someone listen to you? And did anyone actually have your listening partner just reflect back to you just what they heard you say? Did you do that? <laughs> if in focusing companionship, which we'll talk about, that's the job of the listener. The job of the listener is simply, uh, and Carl Rogers was the great influence in this, is to hear what you're saying and try to reflect back to you uh, what you're sharing so that you can see whether or not it's accurate. You know? Well, it, uh, what I hear you saying is you felt excited. Excited. No. No, it's more like ecstatic. <laughs> that's the word. Uh, that's the way I was feeling. So we need a kind of knowing witness who, again, doesn't interrogate. Why do you feel that way about your mother? <laughs> you know? Uh, or, but we need someone to, to know that we are seen and heard. I want to say a word about I've been thinking a lot about knowing witnesses, maybe also in the context of, of this kind of conference. Um, uh, the year after the clergy sexual abuse scandal here in Boston, there was a fellow who took up uh, a 40-day vigil out in front of the chancery. Uh, maybe you saw him on Commonwealth Avenue. It was in the middle of summer, every day he was there. And 
after about the second week, I would, if I was going by and I'd stop at the um, uh, store 24, I would just bring him a thing of water. And um, we would just chat for a few minutes. And I gave him my card. I said, if you ever want to talk about anything, you know, feel free to come by the Department of Theology. And he said, I may use this sometime. And about three months later, I got a call from him and he said, I need to come by. There's a piece of work I need to do. I just need you to witness. And he came by my office and um, I asked him what would feel safe. Did he want the door open or shut? And he said, well, it's okay. Why don't you keep it shut? And all he did was sit on the floor and weep for half an hour. He never said a word. I never said a word. At the end of the time, he got up and said, thank you, I needed that. I needed to be seen. And I have no idea what he was working on. I do have an idea what he was working on. But, but what he simply needed, and I think what we all need, is to feel someone is there as we do the work of dropping inside and accessing complex and difficult things. Um, in focusing, uh, there's something a little more interactive if one goes through the process by helping someone notice and stay with uh, and get, get uh, compassionately curious about what arises, which takes us actually to the second big idea in focusing. It's called the focusing attitude. Um, many of us are trained to regard our, um, our minds as, as enemies, as sort of scary places. Um, any of you know Anne Lamott's uh, operating instructions? She, uh, one of, she has this great line in there. She said, uh, my mind is like a bad neighborhood. It's always 3 a.m. There's broken glass, mad dogs, muggers, and dog shit. I try not to go there by myself. <laughs> <laughs> that, by the way, I think is part of what that knowing witness is about, is I try not to go there by myself. Um, but the, the, uh, the habit we have is regarding the contents of our mind when it arises, um, and here I'm going to sound a little Buddhist on you, with either attraction or aversion. Uh, something arises, ooh, that's a great thought. <laughs> or, ooh, I can't believe I'm thinking about that. Um, the, the focusing attitude is to regard everything that arises in our body-mind uh, with a kind of compassionate curiosity, or Anne Lamott says that, Treat yourself like you're a well-beloved, mentally ill aunt. <laughs> you know? um, but it was actually the Sufi poet Rumi who captured this most wonderfully in his poem, The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and welcome them in. Be grateful for whatever, whoever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Be grateful for whoever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Now, the use of therapy, or the use of focusing in therapy or any human interaction uh, is a process of modeling that kind of welcome and supporting one another in uh, hospitality with that arising because it regards everything that arises as potentially a gift to our understanding. There's a wonderful Buddhist uh, teaching story that actually uh, illustrates this point. Milarepa, great Tibetan uh, lama, is making a solitary retreat in this story. And um, these demons start uh, showing up outside his cave, howling and uh, shouting obscenities and so forth. And it's very distracting. Uh, now, in the Tibetan understanding, everything out there is really a projection of our own mind. Uh, but he tries to get rid of them. He exercises, in the name of the Buddha, go away, or whatever. <laughs> they just keep coming and coming. So he uh, calls for consultation. He prays to his own teacher, who shows up in a rainbow. That's the way people come and go in, in Tibetan stories. And he says, what should I do? I can't meditate. I, I just keep having these horrible demons show up. And his teacher says, look, this is what you do. Next time they show up, instead of getting angry at them and shouting at them, 
just say, come on in. Would you like to have some tea? Let's sit down and talk. And the story, the demons come in, have tea, and they turn into divas, uh, helpful uh, guiding spirits. I think this is very useful um, as you think about prayer. I mean, there you are trying to be holy, and all of a sudden this, whoa, you know, grade A, violent fantasy, or sexual fantasy, or who knows what sorts of rising, and you're like, you, you like Milarepa, you want to exercise it. But maybe if you relate it, well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, what do you have to teach me right now? Uh, what does this say about how things are for me? Let's have a conversation. You may discover that, in fact, that's a path to uh, a deeper, more compassionate familiarity with, with how things are for you in that moment. Does that, does that speak? Um, and, and that, of course, is also uh, the way we regard someone who is sharing anything with us. Um, because we are so interpersonally attuned, right? Um, this, this is what I think, uh, one of the things I was getting from Bob's presentation, um, that it's the, the feeling subtext of what we're saying that is really being picked up. Um, let me tell you one of the places where I went as Bob was talking, again, going back to my, my son, thinking about this little pericope of behavior uh, the other day. Um, I said, um, you know, Sash, if, if you wanted a Kindle, because I discovered that he had done one last bit of high school work totally off of his um, cell phone. He had, he had, you know, I don't know how you read this damn thing, but you know, he, had, he read all the science texts off his cell phone. So I said, um, I, I would be willing to get you a Kindle. And he said, well, Pop, if you really want to get me something, get me this, this really neat new phone that's got a Kindle app. And my first reaction is, no, I'm offering a Kindle, not a new phone. Okay? It was a little like, no, I don't make announcements at the end of class. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, thanks, and was a little bit crestfallen. And um, fortunately, you know, we have a consultation. She doesn't arrive in a rainbow. We arrive at her office at MGH, talk every week, my partner and I, about how to do parenting with a, with a, a child we adopted at five from Russia, who came with all of his own baggage. And I happened to tell this story. And I was feeling, I was cemented into the rightness of my position. My intentions were pure. Were they? <laughs> and I was invited to notice you know, what was going on there. And, and it's complex. And I'm still in the midst of this. It's hard to talk about because this was just Thursday that, that very kindly the therapist said, I wonder whether there's a kind of edge of anger underneath that. You're really, you want him to be a particular way. Now, I have a son who's mechanically inclined 95%, and he is not an academic at all. And that's my day job. And so I'm wanting him, isn't this all of our issue with our parents? And everyone else is like, you know, do you love the kid you got or the one, you know, you, you thought? You, and, and I'm having to look and try to fo do some focusing on underneath that, no, I offered a Kindle, not an app, not a cell phone, some way in which I'm really disappointed. I mean, there's, a, there's some very complex stuff going on here. And it's hard to access because as Bob reminded us, we've got uh, identities. I'm not the kind of person who would behave toward my son the way my father behaved toward me, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't cogwheel down generation. So, um, you know, we always teach the lesson we want to learn. I'm teaching focusing because that's what I've got to learn to do in order to really be present and available uh, to the people I love. But um, if I had stayed within the surface of, well, you know, this, this cell phone is probably $400 and the Kindle is only $125 and we don't have the money and, you know, I've been very rational about it, I would have missed the way in which that whole interaction had a power dynamic to it. And there were things going on there that he was more attuned to probably than I did, you know, that he was aware of the manipulation. And I was just trying to be a helpful dad, right? Um, so the uh, evaluative reactions to feelings uh, are the most common alternative to friendly receptiveness. So the, the focusing attitude is to suspend judgment. Thomas Merton said, the opposite of judgment is mercy. <laughs> Regard our 
uh, the contents of our arising awareness with great mercy. Right? Um, sometimes clients have obvious critical reactions toward what they feel. And our job is not to pile on, right? Our job is to ally ourselves with a part of our, our friends, our clients, our, our parishioners, uh, our directees, um, that really wants to be merciful, that wants to be generous, their own innate, compassionate well-being. And finally, big, I big idea number three. Um, there's a theory of change going on in focusing. Uh, and it's trusting the body's own forward movement and knowing process. Um, that, uh, like it or not, uh, the caterpillar in us really, if allowed to move forward, wants to be a butterfly. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a really, really interesting one because in some ways it's orthogonal to the way we think change is always extrinsic. Change is something that someone does to us or we submit to. But uh, Gentleman's big idea, and the reason I think, by the way, this was so simpatico to uh, Jesuits like uh, Matt Mahone and Campbell is that there's the idea that there is an unfolding process. There is that of grace in the way human beings are constituted. Um, and that grace does not uh, come upon us from the outside to take away our interiority and put something else in its place. One of the most awful things a uh, nice evangelical friend of mine sent me is uh, this little metaphor, she said, oh, this is so wonderful. She said, um, human beings are like pumpkins. The grace of God scoops out all the yucky stuff and we put the light of Christ inside. <laughs> I was horrified by that. <laughs> Scrape out all the yucky stuff. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> you know, the, the, grace, the grace of God enables us to relate to our yucky stuff as the condition of possibility of, of, of our redemption, you know. Uh, it, Jews, by the way, are much wiser about this. Than they, that the whole idea of, of teshuvah, of, of turning in Judaism, is that that which we want to regard as awful, God says, oh, I can do something with that. You know, just come on, let's collaborate here. Uh, and there's a wonderful midrash on um, the formula for incense on Yom Kippur. One of the ingredients is kalabinum, or devil's dung. It's this absolutely foul-smelling stuff. And the rabbis wonder, as they wonder about every last detail in, in Torah, so why is this an ingredient? And their midrash, their commentary on that is, we need that stinky stuff. God needs it. And that in, in conversion or teshuvah, that actually is integrated. So the lustful man becomes the great artist. The avaricious human being becomes the treasurer of the temple. Uh, all those things that we don't think uh, we, they need to be scooped out and gotten rid of, if we attend to uh, and work with, uh, collaborate, if you will, with grace, that actually is the condition of possibility of us really becoming whole. And so there's a very different attitude. And the idea then is that change uh, happens from the inside out. Uh, there's a lovely little story of a um, uh, Zen master in New York who decides to have fun with the, uh, the guy who's selling hot dogs there in Central Park. And so he comes up to this guy, the hot dog vendor, and the Zen teacher says, make me one with everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the guy you know, gives him a hot dog you know, with, with chilies and, and mustard and sauerkraut and everything and, and gives it to the Zen master. And the Zen master gives him a $20 bill, and the guy pockets it. And the Zen master says, wait, wait a minute, uh, you owe me change. And the, uh, the guy says, Zen master, change comes from within. <laughs> That's the big idea. You know, change comes within. Uh, the uh, gentleman says here, um, a person is not a thing or even an organism, but a carrying forward, a going interaction with the environment. And, and that this interaction has a conatus or intentionality moving forward to a place that is more life-enhancing and actualizing. And this was, this was uh, Roger's big idea, a kind of organismic vitality, that, that human beings have a natural tending toward their own healing and wholeness. Um, it's why uh, uh, Leo Donovan, in his uh, wonderful book, The World of Grace, 
uh, on the theology of Karl Rahner, said, you know, that, that, that nature is graced. Uh, gracia perfectit naturum. Grace builds upon our human nature. And in some ways, this kind of confidence that if human beings can pay attention to and learn to lean into the direction of their own wholeness or healing, um, that's the service we owe, is to ourselves and to one another, is to help make that happen. A um, couple more. How are we doing on time? What is, what is our... Okay. Um, I will, will let you uh, meditate on the, the body's next step here. Um, but the, uh, those passages, uh, one from um, Eiberg and the other from Anne Weiser Cornell, um, uh, I ask you to think about you know, the, what is the wisdom of the body and find examples from your own experience. Because what I'm saying, no, don't take it in my word. You know, just see whether actually this resonates with your own experience of when you trusted um, the body's uh, knowledge to you. Uh, I think in many cases we would have been a lot uh, better off in our church and our world if people who had intuitions, which are often, by the way, dismissed as, well, that's just woman's intuition, right? Uh, intuitions, you know, that new youth worker we got, something about it that I don't trust. We need to, oh, no, no, look at this great resume. And, you know, the quarry came out fine. And just, but often we pick up, because, as, as Jenlin argued, we are located in environments. Uh, we are exquisitely attuned to the interpersonal fields. That's what makes us human. Um, we can lose that ability. It can be squashed out of us. Um, when people grow up in environments where the only safe way is to pay attention not to their feelings but to mother's or dad's feelings. Um, I did a long-term psychotherapy group for many years with gay men from alcoholic families. And these guys, uh, all of them were exquisitely generous, amazingly attuned to what everybody needed. And the way you could panic one of these guys is say, what would you like to do tonight? I don't know. Because they had grown up in families where the way they felt about things had no voice. Their survival depended, as one guy said, I need to know when dad walked in the door within two minutes. Was he drunk or sober? If he was drunk, was he happy drunk or angry drunk, mean drunk? And so all of his attention was out there reading the environment. But very little space for knowing what it was that he was feeling in that moment, right? Because there was no one there to witness and receive his feelings. And uh, it's been argued that the helping professions are disproportionately uh, represented, or the folks who grew up, who've been the priests and therapists and healers of their families, you know, we, show, we, make, a, we make our day job doing that. Uh, and that often means we override knowledges like, am I really exhausted here? Am I burned out? What do I need in this moment? Can you guys recognize sort of a little of that? Okay. So focusing is a way of dropping down inside and attending to that. Let me just uh, say one word about focusing and faith, and then um, we'll uh, just walk through some of the steps of focusing. Um, uh, Campbell and Matt Mahone, uh, in their book, uh, now in a second edition, Biospirituality, Focusing, Way to Grow, I argued, and this is what that whole presentation in Ireland that uh, uh, Tommaso referred to was about. Uh, by the way, focusing got into Ireland largely through uh, uh, women religious and men who had studied in the United States with people like Campbell and Matt Mullen and brought it back. And uh, what's wonderful about focusing, it's a very democratizing way of thinking about how people help one another. Uh, although some people can make a living as focusers, uh, training other people or making that an element in their own therapeutic rep repertoire. Essentially, uh, relationships, uh, focusing relationships can be between any two people who agree to be servants of one another's knowing in that way. Uh, a word about uh, focusing as salt therapy for introverts. When I was studying focusing, uh, you always had a focusing partner. And once a week, uh, either over the phone or in person, you'd have a conversation. I got 20 minutes, my partner got 20 minutes. And um, sometimes you would say, this is specifically what I'm working on. You give the details. But on another occasion, I remember thinking, I don't really 
feel safe talking about what this is about, but I need help walking through it. And we had a wonderful focusing conversation where the individual walked me through the steps that in a few minutes I'm going to show you. Um, and he didn't have a clue what I was talking about. <laughs> and that was OK, because it really uh, helped me do the work. Uh, and then it was his turn, and I did the same thing for him. Um, but their, their big idea is that uh, human beings, uh, and the reason they found Chardin was so important, that human beings are adapted by evolution to see themselves and experience themselves as a process of unfolding in relationship to their environments. Um, and that the holy, the divine, God, however we talk about God, is not somehow up there, the static, unchanging, prime mover, uh, Steven Spielberg's The Force, or wherever you talk about it. Uh, God is really the dynamic process in which we live and move and have our being that is always inviting us toward the more. And my rabbinic friends uh, point out to me that, that this is the true name of God. Uh, if you look at the uh, revelation from the burning bush, God says, who shall I say send me? And God says, aye asher aye, which we often translate as I am who am. It becomes the basis of all kind of metaphysics. The more proper use of the Hebrew there is I shall be there however I shall be there. There is actually no uh, present tense in uh, biblical Hebrew. There's only past or future. And it's, I shall be there. In other words, that, that we are always living on the lip of the unveiling of new, new things. Uh, C.S. Lewis says the best experience of prayer is you get up and say, I never knew before. <laughs> something new arises. Because something is always new arising in our body in relationship to our environments. And that's part of the big idea in focusing. So what does it actually look like to do this? Um, we're going to maybe do just one exercise. I'll explain to you how to do one exercise, because we have to be over by three. Uh, we got 10 minutes. Thank you, Tom. Okay. 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to explain to you this exercise and um, do it on your own, uh, as opposed to the uh, demonstrations say, don't do this at home. <laughs> Go do this at home. OK. Clearing a space is perhaps the most uh, helpful first step. And if you never do anything more than that, uh, you've done a good bit of work. All of us are besieged by a sense of muchness going on all the time. In focusing, the first thing you do is you sit down and you allow your attention to drop inside, almost as if you had a little flashlight You're going down in the basement, and saying, what stands between me and feeling just OK right now? What stands between me and feeling OK? And you notice, what are you carrying? What preoccupations, fears, or concerns? And very respectfully, then, you ask, well, could I set this aside for a few minutes? <laughs> Can I, as it were, visualize taking that concern or problem, packaging it up, and setting it what seems like an appropriate distance from you? And you keep on doing that until you have a little sense of spaciousness. OK, well, let's see, there's the work I need to do, and there's like this argument I had with my dad, and there's, you know, there they all are. But I am more than the sum of my problems. Right? So clearing a space is also a way of setting things at a kind of distance. Um, and then you ask yourself, OK, except for that, do I feel, how is it? And allow yourself maybe to feel the, uh, the freedom of being there with your, as Wendell Berry said, my task lying around where I left them asleep like cattle. <laughs> there they are. Okay. Then in a focusing process, you say, now of those things, what one feels like I'm, I want to befriend and, and uh, spend some time with right now? I'm in this moment, God, I can't go to that one. That's too big. But you know, that, that argument I had the other day that I just, I really need to go back and look at. And you allow yourself then, as it were, to take that back in. And you ask yourself, how am I holding that? What's the whole of that about? Again, it's not analyzing the problem situation to its component piece. It's not about getting smart. It's about getting wise, about befriending it. And noticing how you're carrying it in your body. And see whether there is any arising sense of uh, a word, a phrase, a gesture, 
an image that articulates what that is about. So when I was doing this work the other day, it's just begun, when I came upon the word disappointment about what was underneath my, no, you can't have a, a cell phone, I want you to have a Kindle. And I said disappointment. I had a, a felt shift, a body sort of, oh my God, that's it. There's disappointment. Now, it, to carry that forward, resonating, is disappointment in. Does the body say, yeah, disappointment's it? Then I could say, would it be okay for me to explore disappointment? Uh, what, what all is disappointment like? How does disappointment feel to me? And I might ask it questions like, what do you need from me right now, disappointment? Um, what's the worst part of it? And I would begin to discover new things, like uh, some edge of disappointment is also embarrassment. You know, I live in Newton, where the modal way, which people introduce one another is, well, how's your son doing in college? <laughs> uh, or, well, they get into Stanford, or do they get into Dartmouth? You know, and I'm saying this, like, um, he graduated from high school. <laughs> I think he's going to be a great electrician if he can get a job. So part of disappointment is some kind of way in which I'm attached. My identity is attached to having something to say in those kind of conversations. And so then I could get curious about that without judgment. Dad, dad. You know, uh, okay, why or how it is that I carry that need to come off in that way. What would it be like if I let that go? Could I experiment in my mind of rehearsing? Uh, well, actually, he's not going to college next year. <laughs> He's going to do this. And what would that feel like? So keeping it company is hanging out with yourself. Uh, allowing your own wisdom to have a conversation back to you. Asking it something about what it needs. Uh, what would be the next small step? The, the wonderful thing about focusing is, Jan Lin said, we're always making baby steps. Now what's the, what's the little thing that it needs? So I've been thinking, maybe the little thing that my son needs is to say, do you want to revisit that conversation? I've been, I've been thinking about the apt and the, the Kindle, and you know, maybe I responded too quickly to that. Tell me a little, tell me, how, how about this would be? Tell me a little bit about that cell phone. <laughs> Get curious about why that's important. I don't know. I didn't bother to ask. You know, I started right up. Let me pause a minute. What is all this, I've, I've talked too much at you, but uh, where does this begin to generate some insights? Or what kind of questions or musings do you have as we're talking? Yes, please. This is my first time seeing your folks. When I grew up, I've seen the folks who are told to start holding the rest. I was amazed at what you're expressing. Is things that I've read, like recognizing your identity, turning around and realizing, giving yourself permission to observe your identity, how you hold yourself, how tightly bound you are to your identity, and being able to observe that from a separate space. And then Bergen wrote in uh, what was the Seeds of Contemplation mm -hmm. in 61, before he had his big affair, um, that there's a third set, Spark of the Divine, that can actually work this over there. Yeah, beautiful. I was actually amazed that you didn't bring in. Ab absolutely. Um, when you go on to, the best resource is www.focusing.org. There's a whole section there, Focusing and Spirituality, and you go into it. Most of the essays are actually focusing and mindfulness practice. Um, because, in, in fact, you're absolutely right. There's some way in which Buddhist mindfulness practice has been on to this for 2,500 years. Um, where focusing is different is that in, in classic mindfulness practice, uh, you notice it and you go back to your breath or whatever stabilizes your attention. Focusing is a suggestion about how you might go back to what arised and explore it in a particular way. But um, there's a actually wonderful essays on that site uh, by Buddhist teachers on how mindfulness practice and focusing can actually work together. In fact, at Mass School of Professional Psychology, we're going to, at the end of the month, Joan Klegsbrun, uh, my teacher of focusing, and uh, Charles Styrone from the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy here in Boston, are doing a day-long workshop 
on um, focusing and mindfulness practice and how these really can cogwheel um, because they, they absolutely are complementary practices. And the only uh, conversation they often have is a little like um, Ogden Nash's, do you bathe before shaving or shave before bathing? It's kind of a guy thing. Um, <laughs> do, do, you, do you do mindfulness practice before you focus or do you focus in order to clear space in order to do mindfulness practice? But they, they are complementary, Peter, you're absolutely right. Yes, please, in the back. Oh, okay, it's, um, I should have put that in, Mass School of Professional Psychology, MSPP. Um, and it's, um, uh, it's coming up at the end of the month. It's a Friday, I think it's the last Friday in the month. Um, you can probably find it on the MSPP work, uh, website, but if not, drop me an uh, email. I have the, the most no-brainer email address is my last name, which you've got, at bc.edu. Just drop me an email and I'll send you the information on that. Okay, someone, yes, please. Do you want to, I, Bob, I'd love for you, actually, if you could uh, speak to what you heard today that makes the, uh, the connection for you. I mean, um, I mean, this is, oh my gosh, I have so many quick things. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, it just, I experience this very much more in the kind of second and third conversation of feelings and identity. Um, and, um, the, you know, the, the latter is like a tool for the what happened and Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to yeah. 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 I, um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm struggling. It was really interesting. The, the, the kind of mindful. I mean, a few years ago, we actually had the Harvard Negotiation Law Review did a conference on mindfulness, mm -hmm. and there's actually a symposium issue of the Harvard Negotiation Law Review on mindfulness. Um, and I mean, we know, so we kind of have this sense in our field, which, you know, is kind of very detached from the rest of the law school in some way, that there's something really important here. Um, but I, I feel, I mean, I kind of feel it's a little over my head. Well, it, we're really at a growing edge because so, so much conversation that takes place is all at the level of, of talking heads to one another. Um, I did have the great joy of being on the board of trustees for Quaker Elementary School in Cambridge, where our son went. And the Quakers are really very smart about things. Um, you're there in the board of trustees, you're having a furious conversation, and uh, someone, usually one of the wiser Quakers, will realize that you have galloped ahead of all the feelings in the room. And they'll say, I call for silence. <whistles> now that's radical. In the middle of a business conversation about budget, to create a space to notice what is going on, what is speaking in the room, and allows you in that moment to detach a bit from the ego-driven, my ideas have to prevail, to notice, is this of the spirit? Is this of the light? Is this of God? Uh, try that sometime when you're getting in a really furious argument with your, your spouse or your pastor, whoever says, I think we just need to sit here in silence for a little bit. You know, and us type A personalities, we just go crazy, but. You know, I learned in time to deeply honor what Quakers have learned about uh, meetings, uh, meetings, human meetings. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>